Hey, um, nice to see that there is almost full room. Uh, I'm a little bit disappointed though. There are free seats everywhere. And uh, I just heard that this Netflix guy is having like 18 presentations here. All like, so I'm uh, not there yet. Um, and yeah, uh, my name is Henry Heiskanen. I'm from Finland. This is how we talk. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you can actually play a game today. There are other people from Finland, so spot a Finn. Um, a, uh, yeah, great to be here in La Las Vegas. This is actually my uh, second time in US. Uh, last time I was in uh, Miami. Uh, both times I had the transfer in JFK. Uh, do you know what actually combines all these three nice cities? Which one? Yeah, that one. Uh, they have the best crime scene e investigators in the world. <laughs> have you watched the show? It's amazing. Uh, I mean, it's like this Gil Grissom, uh, great guy. He has a great team. I mean, it's like, uh, that's like really some team like what I would like to have, a cross-functional team. They have coroner, coroner but uh, anyone can pick up a scalpel in the, in the one scene and start like cutting people. And I mean, that's what I like. There are like experts on some area, but then everyone can do something, a little bit something. So I uh, kind of, uh, if someone joins my team, I always tell them, that, hey, watch the episode. and. Uh, CSI where they buried this guy in this, and then like one of the members of the team and then they try to find it like that's that's teamwork uh, I also they actually look great when they are doing that work they are doing so I actually suggested to HR that uh, should we have like a personal appearance as a part of our uh, targets uh, HR didn't like it uh, that's why I have a little bit of this uh, it's not on my KPIs uh, maybe next year. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, building a lake of wisdom. Before we start, a little bit more. Who am I? Uh, according to Hollywood.com, um, I'm a Hollywood production executive, um, but Hollywood hasn't called me back yet. Uh, that's why I'm moonlighting as a uh, data engineering lead at Rovio Games. Um, I recently got promoted, now I'm a director of uh, data engineering, and you all know what that means. Uh, all the recruitment emails, which used to start like, hey, are you interested? They are like, oh, do you know anyone who is interested? So I don't know if I have a, any career after Rovio gig, uh, or after this gig. Uh, so, uh, oh, yeah, I've been doing uh, software development for 20 years. I profile myself as a, a coding architect. Um, uh, 20 years is quite a long time. Uh, I, some time ago, I had a meeting like uh, talking about big data trends to our uh, uh, chairman of the board. Like, what are the big data trends? But because I wasn't able to talk about machine learning, so I was all, like talking everything but machine learning, so then I, I said to him that, well, the trends are, in my opinion, that if you would be in like deep frozen for 20 years, and then uh, you would be kind of woken up again, I, I, I claim that nothing really has changed, because all the big data processing and everything, it's like running SQL in some like database. I, I think like, like uh, SQL might be like uh, what COBOL was for like 97 or something like that. So uh, please, HR people, keep eye out of those like 40, 50 something guys, database administrators and database engineers. Uh, I've been uh, now doing five years of analytics. Uh, so I was uh, in my previous company, I was, uh, um, uh, the, I was in a telecom company who was doing this kind of a mediation software, and then they acquired a uh, analytics co uh, company, and uh, I was responsible to then, uh, I was a lead architect, and I was, my, my job was to integrate that into, into this uh, telco product. 
So that was my intro into actual analytics. And then after doing that for two years, I then joined Rovio as a, well, uh, at the moment, then I was like an analytics lead, but I pretty much have the same team for all that time. Uh, then uh, Lake of Wisdom. Um, uh, how many have you seen the movie? Angry Birds? So few. You should see it, it's really great. <laughs> I hope I can advertise, because I'm kind of advertising Amazon as well, so I, I think we can, like, but hey, it's really great, and there's a scene. Uh, there's a, this Lake of Wisdom is the place where this wise uh, uh, mighty eagle lives, and uh, he, he lives next to this Lake of Wisdom, and, um, and uh, actually in that movie, something happens, and it's quite funny. Um, um, this is a little bit of a spoiler, but there is a little bit of pee in the water, uh, and I don't want you to associate that. Uh, the idea was that it's something uh, about uh, something that, that's like you can associate with data lakes and also to a Angry Birds brand. Uh, so yes, we are talking about data lakes here today. A um, little bit of agenda. So first, I will talk a little bit like a little bit about Rovio and what data means to us, and uh, then I talk walk you through on a semi-high level, how did we build this data lake? And then I also share a few of the learnings, uh, uh, what we learned during this process. Possible takeaways, uh, you can see on the screen. Uh, I would say that the main one is that one highlighted there that uh, how, if you are planning of building this data lake, how, how should you build it? And uh, I don't, say that you should build it exactly how I did. It depends a little bit on your use case, but hopefully this gives you some ideas of the services and uh, methods that are out there for you to build it up. Then about Rovio and data. Um, some uh, fact sheet of Rovio. Uh, so we are the Angry Birds company. We are nowadays a public company, then I need, that's why I need to be a little bit careful what I say. Uh, so these are corporate approved facts. Uh, you can read them, um, maybe something a little bit more interesting. Uh, I just, hey, there is like 11 million daily active users. Uh, so that's how many people play our games on a daily basis. And, but we are not just Angry Birds company, we, we do other things as well. For example, a game called Paddle Bay. Uh, it's a real-time multiplayer battle uh, with boats. So think about um, World of Tanks kind of thing, but with boats, it's awesome. Um, there's a guy sitting there who is top 10, I suppose. <laughs> so if you need any tips on the game, just try to grab him. Um, anyway. And we also did the Angry Birds movie, and sequel is also in the makes. So, but uh, we kind of uh, identify ourselves as a games first entertainment company. So, game, <coughs> building great games is the core of what we do, and then we uh, ensure that we have a good game, strong brand, and then we can do some brand licensing on top of that, using that brand. So that's, that's our business. And uh, so what does this mean there for the data? So as any, I would say all the mobile games, free to pay companies, we are like really, really uh, data driven company. Uh, so for example, when we start a game project, we first uh, do some uh, market research, uh, app any, uh, it's like really open, for example, uh, what games are out there, what they are, what they are making, how many users they have. It's like really open in this business, so you can take uh, data from Appani and try to find trends, what kind of game we should make. And once we decided what game we should make, do some prototyping and whatnot, and finally, when the game is uh, done, getting back to that soon, uh, it's all about uh, user acquisition. So how do we get those users in? Uh, and 
how do we optimize that the user acquisition funnel? Uh, make decisions, for example, that uh, because we have portfolio of games, so we have many games, so we need to, for example, make a decision that, okay, at this point, should we actually show this person or, or device a cross promotion, or should we act, in fact, uh, show an ad from a network, because that way we could get ad revenue. Uh, then uh, also nowadays when a game is out there, it's not actually done yet. So after the initial release, we have the players in, we start optimizing the game, running A-B testing and try to find, okay, uh, how do we make the players play more? What's the, uh, how do we make this game more fun? What works, what doesn't work? So in the context of this presentation, we focus on this uh, performance marketing and game optimization piece. Uh, we have a data philosophy. Uh, one thing is really important for us that uh, we have a single source of truth. So if, uh, if you have multiple dashboards, and all those dashboards show different numbers, different uh, DAU, different retention numbers. That's, that makes, like, people cannot then trust the data. What is the, right, people shouldn't, like, question that, okay, what I see here, is that the truth? We should only have one truth. Even if we have multiple dashboards, they should show, if they have retention, it should show the same numbers in all those dashboards. We also have this, uh, idea of sharing is caring. So that applies in our game teams, for example, game studios. When they make a hit or they make a not so hit or some little, like, let's say just bad game, they will share their uh, experiences. So this applies also for the data. Uh, we, we want to kind of uh, share data. We want to, for example, even provide anyone who wants to access that data uh, and run the queries if they so want to. And uh, then the third one, we own our future. So we, uh, we value and protect the uh, data of our players. So, uh, but we are not in a data business. Our business is to make great games. So we want to ensure that whatever happens tomorrow, uh, we don't want to kind of be uh, kind of a somehow blocked on doing those great games. Uh, we need to ensure that we are able to do where we think we are the best, uh, no matter what happens. So, oh. okay, sorry about that. Uh, so this is the architecture that we had uh, before Lake. Uh, uh, well, I, I think it's quite traditional um, big data architecture, I would say. So we have, uh, let me see if this works at all. Uh, sorry, well, a little bit bad. Okay, but we have here in the left-hand side, we have a, uh, the game client, we have an SDK, our internal SDK, and from the game client, you can send uh, analytics events into our collection API. Uh, you can also, we, we have also services, like a login service. If you do a purchase, you, there's a purchase service that validates your purchases and ensures that you get the goods in the game that you, you uh, buy. And then also, uh, for example, we, if, you, if we show ads, we, we, we use ad service to that. So also those services send data into our data collection endpoint. This uh, collection endpoint is really simple. It just uh, decodes the package and, uh, sorry, encodes the package and then stores it to the, sorry, decodes the package and stores that to Kafka. And then from Kafka, we have actually two, two uh, different modules, so we have a, a thing that we called Packager. So basically that just streams the raw events into S3. And uh, then we have some uh, real-time functionality. We use App as Flink to that, but that's basically, basically for monitoring purposes. So we do, we have uh, this way to do this kind of customized uh, aggregates, like aggregate the data, like unique, uh, 
uh, unique visitors during the last 10 minutes or something like that. And then we publish that information in a dashboard. So purely monitoring, like, are we showing, are our ads placement for working, for example. Most our reporting is done in the batch side of things. So we, uh, here on the, from the raw data, we do daily aggregation, or we did daily aggregation of the data, stored that uh, on the play, we aggregated the data on the daily and player level. And then we store that data into Amazon Redshift database. Uh, we also had this uh, raw data import process where we imported the data into a third party analytics system. And uh, from the Redshift, we basically then calculate the KPIs and, uh, and uh, publish then that, uh, basically import that data to ClickSense or into the Beacon tool, which I talk uh, about later. We also store the profiles into the Cassandra database so we can serve uh, different services, provide the uh, player profiles and some uh, insight to the actual uh, game servers, for example. Uh, all this is then uh, kind of uh, orchestrated using this Azkaban workflow manager. So, um, take, think about this architecture and then yeah, especially I want to highlight this. Uh, uh, like we had, we have raw data, but it was a little bit far away from the actual uh, dashboards, which is kind of a, you could consider those as a tool for the kind of the a little bit higher level tool for for non data engineers. Okay, so if you think about that architecture and then compare it into our data philosophy, so uh, did we have single truth? Actually, we didn't. We had multiple dashboards, all based on the raw data. So, or some of them based on raw data. So, different dashboards actually di show different numbers. Uh, what about sharing? Uh, well, there was some sharing, but the, the fact was that there was like really limited access to the dashboards and the raw data. And uh, what about? Uh, did we own our future? Well, I suppose we did. Um, but the main point was that, well, it's not perfect, but I, I think we have more important things to do. So nothing was basically done. And then this happened. We got this email, which pretty much said that, okay, that third party analytics platform that you saw in the architecture, that was acquired by a, another mobile games company. So before we go into what we did, let's have a quick look what we actually already had. So I've mentioned Beacon, and it was in the architecture slides. So what is Beacon? So uh, Beacon is our cloud service platform that you can use to run uh, games. And uh, I, I, I think you've all heard this games as a service. Uh, so that's pretty much it. You could run uh, live operations, for example, for your game. So it had features like analytics. Uh, it had tools for A-B testing, uh, tools for segmentation. For example, uh, we had a churn prediction or a running churn, churn prediction for players, which we can then use to, for example, uh, uh, prioritize our uh, support tickets. Uh, we also have a system for managing the IAP uh, purchase catalogs. Uh, we have, like mentioned, ads. And then we have also a tool for push. That's not widely used uh, push, at least in the US, but other countries uh, where server-side push is still uh, You can do it. So that's where we can use that. So we had all these great tools. but. So oh, sorry, this, okay. But what was missing uh, was the ability to, for data analysts to build these game-specific dashboards uh, using game event joined with portfolio-wide games business data. So with the uh, game-specific dashboards, I mean that all these dashboards that we had in Beacon and in ClickSense, they were kind of really game agnostic. Like I said, like how many users did we have this day? What was the retention? 
uh, and uh, how much money, uh, what was the average revenue per user. Uh, so that didn't really care what was the underlying game. So with this, uh, I mean, for example, level funnels. Uh, games have different means to define what is a level. So um, we, all, these, all these dashboards that were like measuring how game, like game economy works, there's, they were done with this third party tool. So this is what the situation was. And then we were kind of thinking, okay, what should we do? Should we buy yet another app analytics vendor uh, or solution? Or uh, should we build this ourselves? So, damn it. So <laughs> we decided to, I don't know why this is not working well. I, they told me that it takes time for the slide to change. That's why I'm not spamming this. But I mean, it just doesn't receive that command. Anyway, so we decided to build it. So all good, but we had only seven weeks time to do it. And so we move into how we did it. So let's recap what we need. So we need petabyte scale data warehouse. People don't like that word, so that's why they double quotes. Um, with fast access to raw data sets. We also want to uh, efficiently query this data and process the data from multiple systems. So meaning uh, with multiple systems, I mean that someone might want to use Spark, someone wants to just use SQL, someone wants to use some uh, notebook, something like that. So uh, we want a system that you can kind of, uh, or we don't want to have like only one system that we can use that data. And then we also want to have a data visualization SDK. So some way of someone to create a nice dashboard and publish that hopefully in our beacon UI so that we don't, it would appear for this user that actually it's the only, uh, only one product behind the lines. And uh, when we started looking into this, well, data lakes were all the rage. I, I think they still are. Uh, this is a, a snippet from Wikipedia, um, definition of data lake, but maybe the, with few words, uh, I would say that um, like having data on its like original format, raw format somewhere, and schema on read, they are uh, quite often mentioned. So if you think about this, uh, didn't we then have already a data lake? We had those, that data in the S3 already uh, partitioned there in the JSON format. So, um, I think we could do a schema on read. So we had it, all right? No, uh, I, I don't think we actually had because uh, we had like huge human latency because we didn't, uh, basically if you wanted to start querying the data, you had to first launch a cluster. We didn't have any clusters up and running all the time. Um, uh, there was no schema anywhere. So it pretty much meant that if, for example, you run something on Hive, you first create the external table. You should know what is inside those JSON documents. Uh, there was also query latency. We were running, uh, for example, a lot of Hive queries. So uh, it, takes to, it takes time for you to run a Hive query. It's more a tool for scheduled processing. And uh, all this kind of resulted into a fact that there were only few people, uh, I say tens, of people in the company who knew how to access that data or who really wanted to. There would have been maybe the technical competence for people to access the data, but it was like so difficult, so let those guys do it. So then we had like a data engineering bottleneck in our company. So why we then, then thought about Amazon Athena? So we were already like, Rovio is using Amazon uh, in our cloud services. We were really, uh, fluent with it, uh, didn't really feel like chasing a provider. Uh, we, we wanted to have the data and the processing layers separated. Um, so mo many of the services where you, for example, uh, those like big data, MPP databases, so uh, they kind of join the both. So if you want to have the processing, it kind of uh, involves also having the disks in. So 
it kind of, uh, if you needed more disks, you actually also bought more processing power and uh, it becomes really, really, or may become really, really expensive. And then also uh, it had this paper use billing. Uh, so a lot of our uh, clusters, uh, we had some, uh, well, for example, now we nowadays run a Presto cluster. So there is some, they are not running like 100% all the time. So there is some uh, overhead then when we provision the clusters, like sometimes they are running a little bit cold. So we really enjoy the fact that, okay, you could just run a query and then uh, pay for what you are querying. And then uh, performance needs to be at, at least on par with alternative solutions. So let's look at the performance first. Um, so here we, we run, this is like we run many tests and this it looks like really simple, but this kind of, we, we quite often uh, work on distinct counts. So this just shows like, okay, really simple, simple examples what our day-to-day -day work more or less is. So for example, here we first run it uh, on, uh, so we run these queries on the database X, which is a, uh, a solution from uh, another vendor. Uh, then we have run a, uh, like medium-sized Presto cluster, 25, 21 nodes, and then we run these queries on Athena as well. So first we run this on JSON, this JSON sequence file, GC format was our raw data format at the time. And uh, as you can see, Athena performed quite well compared to the Presto cluster, but it wasn't the le on the level what we wanted. Uh, then we, uh, converted the data into org format and the performance was like improved significantly and nine seconds was like, hey, wow, this, this works. Um, so we were happy with that one. Um, so from this we got, okay, we need to have the columnar format and we also need to flatten and repartition and manage the schema. More about this on later slides. But this is the conclusion that we got in. in, in. Uh, but also, we, are, we don't only kind of need that raw data, we also need profiles. And here, when I now talk profiles, I know that there's a lot of it like, uh, there's for example this GDPR uh, legislation coming in, uh, in, um, in Europe. So I, uh, I just want to say that here I'm now talking about uh, profiles like as a technical term and as, for example, a dimension in a, our reporting, uh, not as a way to do like uh, automated decision making, significant decision making that would be harmful for the end, end, uh, end user. So just to make that clear, our legal set that I need to. Everyone got that now, right? Okay, uh, so yeah, so analysis almost always is done on some specific player cohort. And uh, in that third party system that we had, actually each raw event had this uh, player state, which also had the user origin and the cohort, like, okay, where did this player come from? It was kind of baked in into that raw data row. Um, so that's a little bit bad because we have noticed that we quite often need to fix the data. For example, we need to, for example, we notice that, hey, this is actually a hack device, so we should ignore it. So if we, for example, uh, and also other, another thing is that we actually uh, track the user journey uh, by like running a graph analysis on the player IDs, where the different IDs that this player has. So it might be that the user origin changes over time when we find an association that, okay, hey, these actually, these clusters are actually the same. So we may have two years of raw data, and if all of those rows would have a information also about the user origin, then we would have to reprocess all those raw data rows to get that uh, data in. So we wanted to build a system where we, uh, or could we actually build a system where we don't need to bake in the player state and run still efficient queries using joins? So how about joins in Athena? So it's a little bit different query, actually the, even the raw data part. But the main point with this one is that uh, 
the data amount was exactly the same. So, and this query is a little bit more complicated. So as you can see, uh, there was very little overhead uh, from the original uh, query coming from the join. So looked really good. So, <coughs> sorry. So it works. So, and a few more, more, more words about the player profiles. I'm not covering that much in this uh, talk. I'm actually focusing the rest of the slides on the actual raw data processing. But just to let you know that, the, like I said, the profile is kind of the user's journey uh, across our portfolio. OK, where did this player come from? Did we, did we uh, get him from the cross promotion, or did we actually buy, it, buy the user? Uh, how much time this user has spent in our games? How many purchases does this player have? And then we have predictions as well. So lifetime value predictions, churn, cheating, uh, just to name a few. Uh, and then uh, these daily aggregates added to, added to these profiles, we also have these uh, aggregates, like, which are, again, like game agnostic daily and cumulative activities. So how much time did this you have this user spent until this day and also on, on this day? And all this data. <clears throat> profiles and aggregates, they were in uh, Amazon Redshift database. And uh, we basically, to get this available for our uh, uh, kind of uh, dashboards, we, we also dumped this data into S3 and converted that into org format. But uh, I'm not actually talking, uh, uh, the examples are not covering this, uh, but it had really similar uh, uh, similar architecture and uh, similar techniques used, so it's, it doesn't differ that much. And uh, this is the technology selections that we had, so we, uh, or we, we, we took, so Apas Org for the data format, Amazon Athena for the query engine, and then we uh, picked this uh, Redash. I don't know, have you heard about it? It's like a, a quite small company. Uh, it's like really lightweight. Um, and easily, uh, easily we could integrate it really easily, so uh, integrate nicely with Athena as well. Uh, but, but yeah, take a look. Anyway, so um, now let's have a look on our data. Uh, how how does this work? So it's this part from the architecture. Actually, there is a little bit of spoiler. So during this time, we also changed our packager, which was the internal tool that was copying data into S3. We actually replaced it with Secor. Um, great tool for someone who needs to store data from Kafka to S3. OK, this is how our analytics event look like. Uh, they are produced by game clients and our services. They have standard headers and custom message body. Uh, so as you can see here, for example, there is a uh, seed is a game, Seaver is the client version of the game version. Uh, AID one is, for example, the device ID. Want to highlight here that everything is like anonymized. Uh, so for example, if we now allow people to access the data, we don't want to have any personal information available there. And then this part in the block M block. Uh, in the way below, that's the game-specific part. So there can be pretty much anything the game developer wants to put there. Oh, yeah, and uh, yes, the JSON format is used when it's stored to disk, so only the integration with the game client it uses protopuff uh, packets. And uh, then our Kafka topics. So uh, main point on this slide is that we had, when you send events from our game clients, they end up into a game-specific uh, Kafka topic. But then if, for example, Angry Birds 2 is using ads, or a game uses ads, then the game client data is stored into uh, ads topic, and all the game data is then mixed. All the games are mixed in that topic, uh, ads topic. And then uh, this is how the data is then in the S3. So, 
Uh, we have the, well, there is the, basically the Kafka topic, process date, and then we have the uh, gzipped files uh, for, for each topic. And the, yeah, the data format, uh, so they are uh, compressed sequence files and uh, one JSON object per row. And where we want to actually go with this, uh, based on our test, uh, we want to store the data in ORC format. Uh, we want to partition the data by game and event type. So why, uh, why with the game? Because uh, we wanted to optimize this for game teams. So each game team is basically working on their own game. So we wanted to optimize that. So that's why we wanted to partition the data so that it's per game. So you don't need to process the other games if you don't want them. And also the event type partitioning we wanted to add because that additional event type partition really improved the performance significantly over the standard orc should basically also index somehow per, uh, the, and optimize it. But this really, uh, I don't have any numbers, but it has significant, the, the data is like really skewed in our case. For example, if you think about ads, uh, clicks and then adds requests. So it's, uh, that can be like one to 100 times the, so there is a huge skew on the data per event type. So that's why we wanted to do it. So if we want to analyze clicks, we don't need to go all through all that uh, volume of those huge volumes of like uh, re add requests. And then the final uh, schema in the uh, database, if you will, or in Athena. So this is how we wanted it to look like. So it basically, we wanted it to have a flat structure. So quite many DP tools don't like any nested elements like structs or maps or whatnot that you could really do in, in uh, for example, in uh, Athena. But uh, we wanted it to be like, uh, end user experience would be as with the traditional databases. Uh, we wanted to have a table per Kafka topic and a schema per game. And uh, we wanted to have those tables look like they would be partitioned by date and event type. Uh, one uh, thing we had to figure out quite early was that, hey, this org schema evolution. So we have uh, uh, years of raw data from multiple games and services. So. Uh, and uh, monthly game updates, they introduce new fields. So, and uh, reprocessing everything takes time and is expensive. So we don't want to change that every time we, we, we get a new field in. So the solution there was actually to maintain the org file compatibility. And you can do it by following these rules. So if you don't remove any files ever, and you don't change the data, by, uh, sorry, data type of the fields, and you always append the new fields in the end. And uh, how did we then do schema discovery? So actually uh, doing this kind of scalable uh, discovery of uh, your JSON data is like really, really simple. So it's that amount of Spark code. You can yes, take a picture and <laughs> yeah. So, so actually with this, so you can basically get a nice JSON presentation on your data that, hey, this is the uh, JSON, aggregated JSON uh, schema of your, of your uh, data. Uh, but then the actual schema discovery pipeline is a little bit more complicated. So uh, this part here is the actual Spark job that I showed. So it will uh, then uh, output this kind of schema JSON. But from that schema, uh, we actually, what we want to do is we want to maintain that org file compatibility. So then we actually look at the previously uh, discovered schema and merge that and also then add these new fields into the end of the schema. And then we also have this blacklist uh, thing. So there is a lot of noise in our data. So there might be some hack devices. There might be some errors from our test uh, QA builds. So we also want to uh, filter out some of the fields. Uh, for the record, it might be that we change this a little bit, not to do a schema discovery, but instead let the game teams to define this schema. Uh, but let's see. We haven't decided that yet. 
maybe we need to do it now because I went public with this. Okay. So we merge that and then we produce the actual schema. And then we have this, uh, this is, by the way, these scripts are mostly Python. So uh, then we have this generator that picks, uh, takes this uh, JSON file and then it basically creates a bulk of different uh, hive, uh, hive scripts, like hive scripts could create tables, uh, hive scripts to alter the, and adding new partitions if needed. Uh, insert into statements, which are basically the, how we convert the data. More about that in the following slides. And then also Azkaban workflows are also auto-generated. And we have a then system that uh, you, we, we store that into GitHub, and then we basically we have a process then that what you push to GitHub, is it like depending on the brands and everything, it goes into our uh, smoke, uh, sorry, the test environment staging, and then finally to the production environment. Uh, one problem that we actually had was a number of problem with par number of partitions. So, for example, Angry Birds had uh, 73,000 partitions, and uh, actually add columns. And uh, my uh, one of the guys in my team actually said that maybe this add columns wasn't even in Athena when we started. But once we noticed that okay, there is such a thing, it wasn't actually working for a huge table like this. So. Schema update actually needed drop and create table. But uh, then if we do that, actually the MSCK, uh, C, uh, MSCK repair uh, table and drop table, those were actually timing out. So as a workaround, we had to add and remove these partitions of batches of thin and then parallelize that and also add a service limit increase for the DDL statements. And then about how do you, did we actually convert the data? So conver data conversion is quite simple again. So it's basically just copying data from a, a table with some JSON gzip format into a external table that has this org format, format defined. So it's actually really, really simple. Few things that we had to tune. Uh, so for some reason this uh, dynamic partitioning messed up the system, was it so that it actually failed or was like super slow? So we wanted to disable it and it was performing quite well. But then I mentioned about this queue uh, because if you set this, it will, I think it will then create a mapper per a partition where you write to. And then if the data is really skewed, it doesn't, for example, if we have these ads requests, like 100 times more than clicks, it actually t creates only one mapper for this 100 times more data, and it's super slow. So th for that, as a workaround, we use this distribute by uh, clause where we basically distribute it, uh, doing this hashing uh, thing, so we can we basically parallelize it for 10 mappers. Uh, this was really handy. And again, you saw that that's like a nice uh, clean script, but then the actual pipeline is a little bit more complicated. And so here we have the left-hand side, we have these JSON events. So what we do, we again first pull that the day is complete. We actually do it in sec or, well, there's a way that we actually check that all, are all the partitions from Kafka received from some day. So uh, once that's completed, we, oh, I haven't changed this slide. Okay, so this is actually wrong, but yeah, we, we basically add the partitions for the JSON. We do it actually in the start of the day already, so that's a, a little bit wrong order. But anyway, and then once the data is available, we run that Hive uh, job that converts that data into org. And also, so then the data is in, uh, in S3. And Finally, we also generate this add partition script to add, okay, now there's a new day, add a new day into the org table schema and add these new partitions as well. If there's, for example, new event types coming, we, we need to add those as well. And yeah, so, oh, sorry. So as you can see, uh, we have two uh, uh, metastores. So we have one, uh, which is for like Presto, our internal, Metastore, and then we update also Athena Metastore. Um, this is basically 
I, I mentioned this in the following slides as well, but, but uh, currently Athena doesn't support insert into statements. So if you want to do this kind of reporting tables, interim table or this kind of aggregate tables, you don't want to always run a query on the raw data, uh, then you need to, at the moment, use some other technology for that. Maybe they announce something today or like during this week, so let's see. I don't, I don't have any inside info, by the way. So really hoping. Uh, so this is now the architecture that we are running. Uh, so I want to highlight, so I mentioned the SECOR thing already, uh, but then uh, we actually have a now process, as you can see, we uh, convert that data into S, uh, org format, raw data, store that into the uh, S3, and then we also have this cohort data coming from Redshift. Uh, we also streamlined it a little bit our pipeline, so we actually only have like one Rovio business KPI pipeline that produces data to both uh, Beacon and ClickSense. And now, now we have this Presto and uh, Athena clusters uh, serving queries from uh, Redash. Um, so it works really, really nicely. Okay, so let's recap. What was our deliverable. Uh, we now have a well-defined schema. Uh, maybe I wanted to highlight, for example, one service that wasn't mentioned is Supermoon. <laughs> the name is really, really bad, but anyway. So that, for example, is a service that tells uh, in which A-B testing group this user was. So now that data is there as well. And then uh, if you want to analyze your tests, you basically can just uh, join that A-B test information into your game session and uh, then uh, build nice graphs to test, uh, for your tests and analyze them. Uh, then you can query that data uh, using Amazon Athena. This is actually a snapshot from, uh, from Redash. So you can basically build that dashboard by first running, uh, creating a SQL query and uh, then uh, visualize it. And then finally, we integrated this into our beacon tool. So actually you build the dashboards in, in Redash, but then you can actually publish it in the beacon dashboard. So then the game teams don't actually know. They, they have a one portal where they can go and see their, how, how is my game doing? What's the, how is, how is the business side? And how is our actual uh, level funnels and uh, some game specific uh, data at the moment? So it's, it's, it's great. And uh, as a bonus, we also got the lake. So uh, we can use Athena and Presto for SQL, but also some uh, guys are doing really advanced stuff, for example, using Spark. So then you don't need to, for example, first run uh, square queries to Spark and pull that data into that Spark cluster. You could actually kind of, a, uh, you could just query that directly using, for example, Spark SQL. So it's, it works nicely. Uh, so now a few learnings. Um, so when you are thinking like, okay, what data format I should use, we took then org, but as it turns out, uh, Parquet is currently a little bit more widely used, uh, so or supported by different, uh, for example, Alma, uh, Redshift Spectrum first release support for Parquet. So think about that if you're building. Um, org has worked really well for us, but. Uh, if it depends a little bit what you use that, so keep an eye out on that one. Uh, then this insert into support that I already told you though, at the moment we need to run this Presto cluster. Uh, we have games actually that do all the queries from the raw data. Uh, for example, Angry Birds 2, they are actually running this for their two, they have two years of raw data and they, every time when they build, uh, uh, run their dashboards daily d dashboards they actually run on the raw data their queries um, so it works even for that and uh, I, I think that the bill is not that big even even they do it so um, and it has worked ex like really well during last few weeks so I'm just curious maybe they have uh, over provisioned the cluster now before my talk <laughs> I don't know Okay, and then uh, this external Metastore support, we need to update these uh, two different uh, Metastores, our own and the 
Athena Metastore. So I, I think it's now possible to use Athena or this Clue Metastore as your own Metastore as well. But we would rather do it the other way around. We would want to maybe have our own Metastore. It works really nicely and use that in Athena, but maybe it's not possible. Um, mind the number of partitions, so this we covered already. So actually the biggest performance proportions that we had were with the DDL statements. And uh, concurrent query limits. You can uh, kind of increase your limits, but it's still uh, really low, I mean, the default. So uh, actually, we, we, I, I think five is like way too little. We, you're gonna increase it, but uh, I think you should by default offer a like, greater amount of, uh, of uh, concurrent query, queries. And uh, take a look, uh, we like really, follow what new products and services are out there and coming. For example, during the time that we implemented this architecture, uh, there was, for example, the uh, Amazon Glue uh, introduced, Amazon, uh, sorry, Redshift Spectrum. For example, these two services are something that most likely have, would have maybe, um, well, at least the Glue might have been really, really interesting to take a look at. We haven't integrated into that one yet. And yeah, schema discovery is really easy, but the actual schema management can get really, really complicated. So again, I'm sorry I mentioned this clue. I haven't used clue, so I don't know is that good or not, but have a look before you start building your own system. And this one is like, really so biased. So really hard to find like unbiased information. So if you, if you want to kind of a, if you all can, please test your use case. We did actually, it didn't take that long actually to set it, like dif use different uh, vendors, for example, test it out. And it really paid, like gave us comfort and that, okay, this is a system that we can actually use. And uh, as a final note, uh, Amazon, Athena, Presto, Hive, Spark, they are really great together. So I think like this, Athena provides the data for a wider audience, but then, uh, you can use like a little bit more low level stuff if you want to. And one thing I want to highlight that this architecture, actually we have quite, uh, only Redshift is, and Athena kind of uh, can be considered like a vendor, like uh, that we have some sort of vendor locking. But for example, Presto, S3, uh, Presto and org format, they are like uh, open source data format. So we are not, we don't have that bad vendor locking at the moment. Uh, using these tools. So maybe it's something to, worth considering. So uh, using services that are still like based on open source technologies, uh, I, I think it's a good idea. All right, so thank you. That was my presentation piece. And uh, I was told I need to make it clear that this was the official part. And then now some uh, questions, maybe?